Welcome to the Gathering Room at West End Presbyterian Church. My name is Maggie Beamgard and I am the pastor here and welcome to our virtual online worship space. I'm glad that you have joined us today. I want to give a word of thanks to all of our church leaders who helped out with two wonderful events last week. We had a blessing of the backpacks event and our children came and they went around to some little stations and got to offer their prayers for the school year and be prayed over and that was a lovely event and we had our first second Sunday outdoor event uh, that included a Vesper service and it was well attended and I thank all who helped with that and all who came and joined with us so stay tuned for more information about further events such as our second Sunday event in September if you have a school-aged child who is not able to come to the Backpack Blessing Fest, I hope that you will come by the church and get a little packet that we made for them to start their school year off just right. So that's available for uh, our children and our youth, for parents to come by and pick those up and know that you are all in our prayers along with all of our teachers as the school year gets started. We are continuing our series called Unraveled, and today we are taking on the story of Job. And I think Job may be the epitome of a life that has come unraveled. Job loses everything. So we're gonna look at that story together today. I invite you too to come up to the church and get a little take home weaving uh, packet. You can take that home and weave along with us as we explore the theme of unraveling. And at the end of the series, we are going to have a wonderful hanging that will go in our church to uh, represent this time that we've spent together. So I hope that you will pick one of those up if you haven't already and bring your completed weaving to us so that we could include it in our hanging. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds to worship. As the sun rises in the morning, as the cool breeze ushers in the evening, as the heat of the noonday sun spreads across the land, God is present with us. Let us worship God.
What are human beings that God is mindful of us? Or mortals that God cares for us? We are God's beloved children. And with confidence in God's mercy, let us pray. Holy God, we have been angry because we see suffering and we don't understand. We have been skeptical because we know heartbreak that doesn't seem fair. We have withheld love because sacrifice only feels real when it is our own. Forgive us for forgetting that you created the heavens and the earth. Forgive us for withholding our pain from you. Forgive us for thinking we know everything. When the world falls apart around us, when love unravels and life slowly fails, draw us in. Show us your grace, for you gave the wind its weight, and you gave our bodies life. Forgive us for forgetting. Amen. Beloved friends, God loves us beyond any deserving. God is present in all the hurtful places of our lives and gives us the resources to live with what we do not understand. We are forgiven before we even ask. Receive God's forgiveness this day. Thanks be to God. Amen. Hi friends, how are you? Uh, children, I really do miss you. It's been a long time since we have been together. And I want you to know that I am thinking about you right now because I know a lot of you are starting a new school year and that that is exciting and that this school year is gonna be a little bit different from the, your previous school years. And so know that I'm praying for you, I'm praying for your parents and for your teachers too. So I know that when you start school, you're gonna learn a lot of things. And one of the things that you might be doing is asking the question, why? You learn about a lot of things and we wanna know why things have happened or why things are the way they are. Like, have you ever wondered why is the sky blue? Or why do dogs wag their tails? Or why did God create mosquitoes? I've asked a lot of why questions in my life, and I bet that you have too, and I know that your teachers are getting ready to try to help you answer those questions this year. Today's story that I'm gonna preach on in a little bit is about a man named Job, and Job was a man who asked a lot of why questions. Uh, some bad things had happened to Job, and he kept asking and asking and asking God, why did all of these bad things happen? Well, Job never really got a really good answer to that. Nothing that really added up or made sense. But what he did find out was that God was bigger and more loving and more welcoming than he could have ever imagined. So it's almost like God is bigger than we can actually hold in our brains or understand. But it's still okay to keep asking those questions because it draws us closer together and helps us be curious and to explore. So this school year, I hope that you will keep asking lots of why questions. And even when you don't get answers that you want, that you will know that God is with you and loves you and cares for you, just like I do and just like your parents and your teachers. So let's keep wondering together and learning about the wonderful world we live in and the mysteries of the God that we love. Will you pray with me? Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for the wonders of the world. Thank you for letting us ask the questions of why. And thank you for teachers and parents who love us and help us find the answers that we need. 
and thank you for always, always being with us. We pray in your name, O holy God. Amen. Thank you, and I hope I see you soon. Have a great start to the school year. Our scripture reading today comes from the 38th chapter of Job, verses 1 through 7 and 16 through 18. Listen for what the Spirit is saying to the church. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Have you entered into the springs of the sea, or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you, or have you seen the gates of of deep darkness. Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare, if you know all this. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We've been exploring the theme, Unraveled. And if there was ever a story in the Holy Scriptures that embody the unravelment of a human life, it is the story of Job. You know how it goes. He's a rich and a wealthy man. He has cattle and sheep and lots of land and a large family. Job was also a man of devout faith. He went to church every Sunday. He was the clerk of the session. He taught Sunday school. Uh, Job had everything. And then one day, unbeknownst to Job, God and Satan have a little conversation and they talk about all of the people on the earth and they're looking around. uh, And God says, well, there you go. Look at Job. No one is more faithful than he is. And Satan says, well, of course he's faithful. Uh, Look at the good life that Job has. I bet if some bad stuff happened to him, he would not be so faithful. And God agrees to let Satan afflict Job's life. And one day, uh, messengers come delivering terrible news, one after the other. First, reporting of the loss of Job's oxen then the loss of his sheep, and then his camels, and then finally the deaths of his children are reported to him. And to top it all off, Job has a terrible skin disease so that this former man of wealth and riches can only sit on a dung heap and scratch at his scabs with broken shards of pottery for relief. Everything has unraveled for Job, and he is at his lowest point he's ever known. And then his friends show up, which you think would be a good thing, uh, except for they try to explain away Job's suffering. Uh, Surely, Job, just think, surely there is something that you have done wrong uh, that has caused God to treat you this way. Um, Surely there's something that you are just not thinking of that has resulted in this terrible tragedy that surrounds you. Or maybe God is just trying to teach you something. Job, have you thought about that? With friends like these, who needs enemies? But Job won't accept their terms, uh, his their attempts to explain what has happened to him. Um, I'm innocent, he says. I've done nothing. I don't deserve any of this. 
And Job and his friends go back and forth for about 35 chapters while God is silent, listening to this whole conversation. And then God speaks. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? I will ask the questions here. Thank you very much. And God challenges Job with three questions, three kinds of questions. Who are you? Uh, where were you? And are you able? Who are you to decide what is just and not just? Uh, where were you when I made the world? And are you able to make the sun rise or to walk in the deepest part of the sea? Do you understand all about life and death? Tell me, come on, God says. What is God's answering to suffering? Well, the unsatisfactory answer is that there is no answer, uh, not one that Job can understand anyway. Why do the righteous suffer? Why does this good person get cancer and that evil person uh, does not get cancer? Uh, why is this person taken and this one is not? We are creatures and not creator. We are not in control. As the Apostle Paul says, we see through a mirror dimly. At the very center of life is mystery and the meaning of suffering is a part of that mystery. That's not much of an answer, but it is a partial answer. Job cannot know everything, but Job can know this. The God with whom Job deals is a creator God. God does not destroy, but creates. God does not deal in death, but in life. What comes forth from the mouth of God has been called the most gorgeous speech that God makes in the whole Old Testament, and it is composed almost entirely of the most gorgeous and preposterous questions that have ever been asked by God or anyone. God speaks to Job. Who is this whose ignorant words smear my design with darkness? Stand up now like a man. I will ask the questions. Please instruct me. Where were you when I planned the earth? Tell me, if you are so wise, do you know who took its dimensions, measuring its length with a cord? What were its pillars built on? Who laid down its cornerstone while the morning stars burst out singing and the angels shouted for joy? For four chapters, God interrogates Job. Have you entered the springs of the sea or walked in the recess of the deep? Where is the dwelling of the light? Have you entered the storehouses of the snow or has the rain a father? Have you given the horse its strength? Is it by your wisdom that... The hawk soars. Is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes its nest on high? Who can tilt the water skeins of heaven? The world that God created is not a place of chaos. It is a world of creation, of order, of wonder, of life. And that is God's answer to Job. God confronts Job with the mystery and the wonder of the order of all creation. God introduces Job to matters that we moderns have turned over to the sciences, biology, zoology, meteorology, astrology. God bombards Job with dozens of variations of this basic question. Who possessed the wisdom to create the heavens and the earth? The answer is so obvious that Job has only this to say, behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me. Job is awed. He encounters the living God and discovers that he is part of something much bigger than he ever imagined. Job may not understand the meaning of suffering, but Job knows this. Job belongs to the creator. 
if an answer did exist for Job's suffering, I'm not convinced that it would be at all satisfying. I mean, suppose someone really could come to us and give us the real answer for suffering. Oh, well, the reason your child has died was this and this and this, or the answer to the death of six million Jews in the Holocaust was A, B, and C. So we would have an answer, but would knowing why bring us any satisfaction? The death would still be a death. The loss would still be a loss. So what we need is perhaps not an answer, not an explanation, but something else. A strength, a guide, a presence. Presbyterian pastor Tom R. tells about the time his four-year-old daughter fell while running around uh, the house and she cut her lip open. And the cut required a trip to the emergency room and stitches in order for it to heal properly. Tom says they put his daughter in what they call a papoose, which is sort of like a Velcro straitjacket that kept her arms at her side so that she could not move. And they put a sterile drape over her face, leaving her lip exposed, and they went to work. Well, his little four-year-old daughter called out, Daddy, make them stop. Daddy, it hurts. He said he tried to find a place to touch her, but the papoose covered her hands. He wanted to comfort her, but he could not. Daddy, make them stop. Tom said that not only did he not make them stop, but he acquiesced with what they were doing. He wanted them to continue. His little daughter was hurting and he wanted them to continue. It is the anguish that only a parent can know. Finally, the procedure came to an end and the stitches were uh, in and the bandage was applied and the restraints were loosened and the child jumped into her father's arms. The girl did what we do. She trusted her daddy. Even though she could only dimly understand what was happening and why it hurt and why her father would allow this to continue, she knew. She knew beyond the present hurt that she had a loving parent who would not desert her. What we finally need in our times of unraveling when suffering is inexplicable is not someone who can give us reasons for it, like an answer to a riddle or to an algebra equation, but we need someone into whose arms we can go. The God of the whirlwind who made the stars and the planets and flung them into solar systems and galaxies, who made atoms and stem cells to move in their own mysterious micro orbits, who made aardvarks and ants, giraffes and gerbils, hummingbirds and hippos, who administers the tides and the seasons this great God of mystery is the God who waits to receive us. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. And Job answered, I have heard of you by the hearing of my ear, but now my eye sees you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Throughout this worship series, we are creating a beautifully woven fabric medallion. This project tangibly portrays God's moments of unraveling as well as the promise that God hymns us in, behind and before. When life falls apart, the unraveling is an end, but not the end. This project helps us embody the promise of the great weaver, that our loose ends can be woven into something new something beautiful. Today, as you watch the weaving or make your own, I invite you to reflect on a time when you have embraced the mystery of God, even in the midst of suffering. Ask God to help you unravel your need for answers and to weave your questions into a tapestry of awe.
Let us pray. Eternal God, whose thoughts and ways are not ours, you alone are God, awesome, holy, and most high. School us in the ways of faith and wisdom that we, like Job, may learn to truly see and hear and in humility find blessing. God of the whirlwind, as our children are headed back to school and college to learn new things, help us to pass on to them the wisdom that has been given down to us from the generations before. Help our children as they learn their daily lessons to listen and learn and understand. Give their teachers patience and knowledge to teach well. Help them as they learn life's lessons of dealing with the other people around them. And help us as we guide them through those lessons. God of the whirlwind, we ask for your wisdom to discern your ways and your path for our own lives. Give us graciousness and kindness in all our dealings with others, those we meet, live with, work with, shop with, drive our roads with, wait in line with, and eat with. Make us wise as we encounter life's difficulties engage in the public square, and encounter the world's injustice. God of the whirlwind, we ask for wisdom for our leaders in our world, our country, our states, our communities, and our churches. Inspire us through their faith and resilience. God of the whirlwind, we ask for your wisdom as we seek to reach out to those in our community who are in need. Let us not presume we know what is best for all, but let us, through our determination to know one another, discover how we can best be of service. Give us measured and thoughtful words of comfort and love to those who are homebound and sick, in recovery or lonely or grieving. God of the whirlwind, we humbly ask for your wisdom that not only enlightens us, but transforms us and guides us in our daily walk with you. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes. Most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Hear the prayers of our hearts as we seek your counsel.
And now let us pray as the Lord Jesus taught us to pray for our daily bread, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. An important part of our worship time together is not only our singing, it's not only our offering of prayers, and it's not only our listening, but it is our offering. And when we gather together in person to worship, uh, we are able to do that by just dropping a check or some change in the offering plate. But in this season of the life of the church, it's a little more complicated. You've got to write a check and come up to the church and drop it off in person or get it off the mail. And there is not that interaction uh, that we so desire and crave right now. So I want to especially thank you for your continued generosity, for your continued offerings during this season, and for making sure that that part of your spiritual life continues. I also think this is a good time to think beyond just the monetary offerings that we make with our lives from what God has given us. And I want to invite you to think today about uh, your whole self and what you are able to offer to God right now. Everything that we do in the church is different. The ways we engage with each other, um, the ways we listen and look toward the future together are different. So I really want to encourage you to think in the coming days and weeks about how you are continuing to offer your whole self, body, mind, spirit, and soul into God's service. And I want to prompt you uh, to find a way to do that in a tangible way in your life. Let us give God what we have to offer out of our joy and out of our abundance this day. Amen. Well, it's true that we have a lot of why questions right now. Uh, Why did this pandemic hit? Uh, Why is the world so chaotic right now? Why do I have to wear this mask everywhere that I go? Why is the school year so disrupted? And we don't have any easy answers to that. No A plus B equals C. So right now in these days, I invite and encourage you to remember that God is bigger than all that we can understand. Uh, We see through a glass, but just dimly about what God has planned and in store for us. And be encouraged that God is there to receive us and to receive our questions. And that even if we don't have an answer, we have a presence and a person and a wonderful and a loving God. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace this day and forevermore. Amen.